But as a former senior executive at Airbnb and Wayfair, and prior to that at McKinsey and Groupon, do in regenerative agriculture? Why did he read more than 50 agriculture books and all the papers he could get his hands on? Plus doing Create with Nicole Masters, which is one of the deepest regen agronomy courses you can find. What did he learn? What excites him about regeneration now? And where are the Steve Jobses and Elon Musks of the regen going to build their companies? And how can we help more talent flowing into the space? Join me for a wide ranging interview. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode. Our guest of today had a career as a senior executive at Airbnb and Wayfair, and prior to that at McKinsey and Groupon. But now he's devoting his time, skills, and resources to regenerative agriculture. Welcome, Martin. Hi. I'm really looking forward to unpacking an endless amount of rabbit holes here, because I think I've yet to meet someone else that went deeper into, let's say, the regen rabbit hole without being a farmer or own a farm. Um, I think you read over 50 books you're doing Create now with Nicole Masters, I think it's the only non-farmer in that group. So you're going deep and and are uh, sort of resurfacing or maybe better, I think when we had the pre-call, a better way to say is that you're still falling down the rabbit hole and you're reporting as you're falling, what you're seeing, what you're not seeing, the opportunities, um, what excites you as an entrepreneur and as an executive, uh, the technology side. I mean, there's a lot to to cover here. So I'm really looking forward to to doing that, but I would love to Start with a personal question we always like to ask, and in this case, it's even more relevant because you, I don't think you grew up on a farm. Like, how did you get bitten by the soil bug? Like, what was the what was the trigger, if you remember, or were the triggers, if that's uh, more appropriate? I got into it via food and via a sense of purpose, I think. So um, I was always an avid chef, and I think it was a great creative outlet for my more nerdy analytical and uh, managerial work. I, so I was cooking all my life and through that developed a strong passion for food and through that, through going to good restaurants and through the restaurants, understanding the value of produce and from the value of produce, understanding that in the end, it all starts with the farm, the soil, the growing conditions, the genetics. So that was the first arc. The, the second one was that um, after a, a successful career um, in, in running businesses and complex businesses, I really felt like um, the, the, the world is changing a lot. I have four daughters. I uh, don't want them to grow up and look at me and say, Dad, like, uh, what did you do? You know, you were capable and resourceful. We were just standing by or uh, tell me about it. And I was, I didn't want that. And so I then looked more broadly and said, how, how could I help? you know, in a realistic and non-naive way. <clears throat> and then I understood actually a little bit through coincidences that to grow outstanding food, you need outstanding soil. And to have outstanding soil, you need a lot of carbon in the soil. And that started seemingly too good to be true because I felt like, wow, like there's so many Why is things. Why nobody else doing it or telling exactly talking like, about it? Yeah. And, and that, would, that made me both skeptical and excited. Uh, like, think about it. Like, um, if 
a lot of the solutions to climate change that we are faced with are hard trade-offs. You know, we need to retire billions in assets of cement factories or repurpose them. Uh, we just built several new coal plants, I think, in, in, in Eastern Europe. We basically need to hard shut them down in a way and just write off those very big investments. Those are all very difficult decisions. And now suddenly you, you uncover that you could bring a massive amount, like a third to some people think all of men released carbon back into soils and through that actually make it productive and grow better food. Uh, that sounds like really crazy. And you remember like the step from going to really good restaurants and maybe talking to the chefs and they, they say, yeah, of course, we are, we're the artists, but it really starts with the, the, the ingredients and it starts with the farm. And still, sometimes it feels like maybe that's changing a bit, but it, it often we put the, the chef on uh, in the spotlight and not necessarily the soil. Like, do you remember when that, that word soil and, and, and the essence or the nutrients and the quality and the flavor come from soil? Do you remember when that started to pop up maybe in conversations with chefs or something? Because that when you go to chef's table, you see, or you go to these restaurants, I don't think all the time now it's changing a bit, but mostly it's still, oh yeah, we get amazing food in and that's sort of where it ends. It doesn't start talking about flavor and carbon, let's say at the dinner table. Has that has that changed or you remember when that came into the conversation? That is very true. It was quite a frustrating um, wild goose chase for me to understand. Like for a long time, I thought the only way to get good produce is to go to <clears throat> Naples and buy tomatoes there. Uh, till, um, I met a friend who told me, actually, Marcus from New Foundation Farms, <clears throat> that it's actually the soil much more than the sun, you know, and uh, and then the genetics to work with that soil. It's kind of a, it's, it's a very complex answer. I have not seen many chefs who know that, um, but I've seen many chefs who understand it intuitively, just to their palate. Because they taste. Palates. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and um, a, another big breakthrough was was um, Dan Barber's third plate and and his partner Jake Algier, um, who I was able to meet and and talk through that a lot more. So it was it was step by step. I, I wish I would have had a fast track into it, but now I know. And basically, one of the reasons we're talking as is one of your hypotheses is if more key decision makers, both in companies and in in government would know what you know and, and what many listeners know as well and and if this would be common knowledge um, that there is a way to to fix many things I'm not saying it's easy not naive but it doesn't require um i mean it requires uh, getting rid of some assets but doesn't require uh, super extremely hard decisions as we have to take in cement and in other sectors and and so you you see this and you maybe read a book or two and and you get curious what made you decide not to stop and think this is too good to be true? This is this sounds naive. Why is nobody else around me getting excited about soil? Um, maybe it's not true. Like because the the notion of seeing something that other people don't see mainly triggers with many people. Like probably it's not true, and this sounds too good to be true. Let's just focus on something else. EV adoption with solar or or uh, something like that. Like what triggered you to keep digging, 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 and and digging properly? I think it's like in you know, this case. Uh, the chicken that has this line of corn and just follows it around <laughs> wherever it goes. I, I just was lucky enough to find the corn always like not too far out. So think about you read um, the, um, the third plate from them. But first I read Cooked by Michael Paul and then I read, which is like a very, it's more of a foodie book than about a soil book. But yeah, there's some, some led, pieces of it in it. Yeah, there's some, he raises some questions on growing. Like I think in the, I think it's the pig meat piece or something that it really talks about um, price and and why that if I remember the why these barbecue masters are using industrial pork uh, if I remember yeah. the, the lines no, so no, there, he's remember raising remember a few price. points. Um, but that then I I found you know like through that foodie part still I I, I knew of Dan Barber third plate came out. And Amazing book to third plate. By I went way. through yeah, the that's... references you know like I just literally like. I started like, you know, I basically through that book, I then read um, Gabe Brown. Um, and then I started to see something very real there. I started to read the Montgomery books. I started to read Nicole Masters. And then then basically there was, I, I had a smell like a, like a gold digger, you know, that there was a vein coming up. 
Fascinating. Yeah, then you went for the deep ones. And then, because just to give a, a reference, like we're talking beginning of 2024 and and you, you've you read over 50 books, like what are the the main, what surprised you the most? Sorry, let's let's start there with with this um, with this deep dive and and all the farmers you talk to, uh, the deep agronomy work you're doing now. Like, what's your biggest surprise? That um, the current ecosystem is so entrenched that despite overwhelming evidence, it's still quite anecdotal, but it's overwhelming. Um, um, there is still very little change. And that was motivating me as well to think, <clears throat> can I help as a catalyst? But think about it, like you, it's quite mainstream knowledge. Farming isn't very profitable. <clears throat> Farmers are leaving in droves, <clears throat> big succession problems, big health concerns. Like a lot of them, like the, the, we read a lot about glyphosate, but there's a, a much bigger iceberg underneath that, like neonicotinoids and other stuff. <clears throat> the, the mainstream media hears about bees dying and, you know, like stuff like that. But the toxicity farmers that are farmers are exposed <laughs> to, yeah, the, the suicide rate is insane. Um, like the, basically this model, like we are getting obese in, in the same amounts. So the evidence that what we're doing right now is not working is absolutely irrefutable. And at the same time, there is overwhelming evidence of pioneers that there is a better system, but it hasn't reached the mainstream at all. And I think that was the biggest surprise for me. And what do you then think of, and then we're going to unpack why and what to do about it, because there's so many excitement, because every time we talk um, and you've been deeper, I, I always ask, like, are you still excited about the opportunities or have you uncovered other things that we, or maybe, um, uh, maybe it just turns out to be a few lucky examples and that's it. But what I feel also when like in mainstream media or in the, like the bigger climate space, food and agriculture and specifically region is not being taken very seriously. There's some very vocal opponents um, Jonathan Foley of Drawdown has been blocking people on LinkedIn, actually, and, and other opponents, like specifically on the ruminant part, but we'll get to that. Like, but it also feels like it's not been taken seriously, even within the climate movement. Imagine outside that where we have to get uh, a lot of support. Like, what, why do you think that is compared to maybe EVs, which also get pushed back, but sort of that seems to be settled or, uh, uh renewable energy? Like, why, why is the regen movement not getting the love it's, uh, I it mean, deserves, EVs, even within climate. <laughs> EVs would be dead, like dead, dead, without the insane effort of Elon Musk. That's just, it's a one person changing it all, in my opinion. And that has nothing to do with me assessing any of his other stuff. It's just like, literally, I don't think without him, it would have happened now. It might have happened. So we haven't had, we haven't had the Elon Musk of region. Is that what you're saying? Um, I don't think that this is how it will work in, in region. I think there is going to be a much more concerted group effort. But yes, I think that is a big, that is part of it. The, um, the other thing is like, I studied philosophy uh, a long time ago, and I was quite enthralled by the structure of scientific revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. Um, it's about how paradigms change in the scientific world. And uh, I mean, not to spoil it, but in the end, the takeaway from the book is that the old generation needs to die off and make place for the new one. So it takes a very, very long time. Einstein did not like quantum physics at all. You know, like God doesn't play dice or something like that. And that was Einstein. So it is absolutely Imagine. normal that there is massive resistance from incumbents. And also there's this psychological dilemma if you have been doing something for 30 years, but even if you feel that this is not really right, changing would also admitting that you wasted 30 years of your life, you know? For most people, that's an insurmountable obstacle. So why is now different? Like, because we've, some of the masters you, literally Nicole, but others as well, have been in this for 10, 20 years, some, some even more. What, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, interested in this space, wanting to do something, you don't want to be going against the tide or at least not having the tide with you a bit. Like why is now the moment, apart from the super urgency, which I mean, you only have to look outside and, and see that. Um, why is now the time for, for regeneration and for regen ag? I think that there's two, <clears throat> there is an, um, 
the scientific base is more and more now put together. We understand the soil food web. We understand the second order effects of fertilizers. We understand um, the uh, the potential to make carbon effective, and um, which is um, really terrible um, is how much we ignored the work of Mian Mian, who was in your podcast about that a lot of the weather phenomena, wildfires in California, um, ex extreme drought and flooding in Germany or in Northern Italy are actually man-made and not through carbon, but through barren soil and uh, and, uh, and, and sealing off of, of, of um, uh, coastal areas, which is actually great news. It would be very reversible quite fast. But so these, the, the scientific understanding of what went wrong is now in place. That wasn't the case 10 years ago. And I think the second one is just sheer desperation. Like time is running out and a lot of the, the levers to stop global warming are just plainly not there yet. So what can we do now to buy us time? It's agriculture. And so what within agriculture like do you now see i mean that the changes over time as well as you learn more and go deeper and deeper but let's say now at the beginning of 2024 uh, what are the main levers that excite you that you're like whoa that are neglected partly but also like uh, create not saying the tesla moment or but create huge potential opportunities for entrepreneurs and executives like like yourself and your friends because i know you're talking to a lot of your friends and trying to get them excited about agriculture and food and, and you need some some stick or something or some some carrot to to um to get them excited what are the main ones you you focus on now as i'm more of a financial person i would probably lead with that when you think of a like revenue top line of a farm let's say you make like a hundred thousand in revenue typically 30,000 goes to inputs, which is particularly uh, chemical inputs, like fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, anti-parasitical agents, uh, or medication for livestock. We now know that you basically can get that to more or less zero. So, and without like, any like losses really in output like there's a little bit of output loss depending on the quality of your soil which is often degraded after all this use um, but over time you're quite good so if i tell you i have an alternative business model that saves you 30 percent of cost suddenly that flips an industry absolutely i think that's quite compelling and so what do you need, what do farmers need to, like you say, as we know now, or we know now, like this is relatively, or this could be common knowledge. Like you can Google, you can YouTube yourself, you can, uh, to, to this knowledge. And yet we see many farmers logically not taking that jump. Um, is that a, you let the question with, I'm a finance guy, is that a finance uh, answer to that? Like to massively transition a hundred thousand, two million, whatever farms and like, but sort of travel them over time to get them through that that um, that transition period. Is that mainly a like a, a finance question, or do you also see a lot of agronomy needed to get people? Going? I think it's. I think there's a finance solution, but the underlying problem is industry specific. I think that it has to do with cycle times. When you think about industries, each industry has their own characteristics. Some industries are very manufacturing heavy, others are very research and development heavy, others are high in risk. You know, in pharma, you bet on one or two molecules and they could literally make or break your company. Um, farming is characterized by extremely slow cycle times. Like if you're a chef, your cycle time is about five minutes. You make a steak, five minutes later, it's done. If you screw it up, you do another one another five minutes. It's very hard not to make a good steak if you have 20 steaks lying next to you raw and you have enough time. Think about that and contrast that with farming. You plant and then you harvest a year later. So in your whole life as a farmer, you might see 40 harvests. A chef can make 40 steaks in half an evening. So think about what that does with your psyche. 
it makes you risk averse because if you screw it up, one of your 40 shots is gone. I think we need to understand that in order to understand why agriculture is not a, an industry where it's likely that they adopt change very easily. And so this brings me to, I think there's a finance. So if, if we think that the risk is manageable of transitioning, then we can underwrite that risk um, and share that risk with the farmer. So I think there is a finance solve. I think there's also a, agronomy can reduce your learning cost quite dramatically. And I think that helps with the underwriting, but I think one of the solves is underwriting. And within agriculture, like what pieces of the puzzle excite you the most? Or what is it the ruminant side? Is it uh, the grain side? Like where do you see um, the most potential, the short-term potential of getting, of buying us time? Maybe first, I think a good frame of reference is um, you are made the autocratic emperor of let's say Europe or the US, the caveat is you need to do it for a thousand years. And if your people are not happy, they might still topple you over, you know? Um, so if you do it for a thousand years, like saying like, oh, I put a little bit more fertilizer in, but you know that your land will degrade and in 30, 40 years, your topsoil might be gone. It's not a really smart thing to do. So you need to find a solution. Many ancient civilizations, we believe, perished because they couldn't feed themselves because they were heavily reliant on annual crops and they degraded their soils. There's quite a lot of evidence on that. So if you learn from history as the autocratic coon of Europe for a thousand years, that wouldn't be a good solve. So you need to think very carefully about which land do you put best to which use. And we actually do know quite a lot about that. It's just a little hard to implement it in practice. Um, even though in Britain with some subsidy schemes, recent ones, they're moving ahead, like some land is best to rewild. And there's very little argument about that. It's just you need to jump over the cliff and, 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 and just start doing it. Some other land should just be pasture or basically a lot of land should be silver pasture where you just build oaks and, uh, uh, and have a loose canopy of trees and underneath you have pasture and, and, and ruminants and, and pork grazing or whatever. Like, so we kind of have a lot of these answers. That's the foundation of my answer. The, the second thing is what, what excites me most. I think what's the fastest potential is I think instead of feeding cows corn in concentrated feeding operations, uh, ensure that all cows are grass fed and grass fed only. Uh, and put them out on pasture. Um, we can do that. It's quite straightforward. We have enough land. All those thesis that that's not true is, is I think, just bogus and not not uh, uh, not really. Yeah, because you get a lot of pushback on that, saying, "Yeah, but we don't have the land, and we have to put them inside to do to to feed them because we have more than we had before." And and you're saying that's just bad bad math. Yes. Um, there's two things to consider. First, a lot of our land is still used to produce ethanol and non-food products. Like, uh, like in a world where we want, which we want to decarbonize, I'm not so sure we should grow food and, and, and agriculture space to burn fuel or whatever. Like that's first, I think and that's quite a lot of land. The second, there's quite a lot of agricultural surplus. The third one is that if we run proper pasture, this is actually very productive if we do proper accounting. And the fourth one is, you know, even if all of that doesn't suffice and we need to eat a little bit less meat, I don't think that's the end of the world either, you know, because the, eat, the meat that we're eating right now, which I think one of the things that is often not mentioned when you go full cycle, if you feed corn to cattle, it's so high in omega-6 that it clogs up your arteries like crazy. Red meat, the way we raise it is incredibly unhealthy. Red meat, if it eats what its evolutionary purpose is, which is grass and nutrient cycles, uh, our pastures, it's actually very healthy and very energy dense for human consumption. And that gets us to the health piece, which you find extremely important and, and relevant as well. One side, I think on the urgency as, as we're literally eating ourselves to obese, uh, obesity, and and the other thing as a lever as well. Do you see 
the potential for, I mean, food as medicine or the quality focus, not just in, in fancy star restaurants, but let's say for, for normal daily consumption. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on getting serious consumer demand through quality and, and health and not through, oh, this is better for the soil and better for the world and better for the, the small water cycle? When you look into the, a few of the top nutrients that feed us, so maybe let's let's separate first. I am an avid believer we should not have ultra processed foods. There is incredibly overwhelming evidence how and in what which ways they are very bad for us. Um, there's a very good recent book, Ultra Processed People, that I can highly recommend. Particularly, the last chapter summarizes it. Like it's it's by irrefutable that this is making us very very sick. Um, this said, um, if we don't eat ultra-processed foods, we still have the problem that the meat that we're eating is very high in omega-6, which is just because we feed it the wrong stuff. Um, there's this other wonderful book, What Our Food Ate, from Montgomery and Bickley. Um, and it's actually that. What our food eats is what we eat. If our plants don't get a lot of nutrients and we eat those plants, we don't get a lot of nutrients. If we feed our animals stuff that we shouldn't eat, we eat what, you know, in the end we shouldn't eat. Um, and um, omega-6s clog our arteries up um, very fast. So eating meat from cows that eat predominantly grains is just not healthy. Um, and if we start fixing that and we start... Um, using population grains and uh, more ancient grains, all the problems of gluten intolerance will fade away very fast. Think about it. Gluten intolerance is like a 10 or 20 year old phenomenon. So that should make you think already. I think there's a lot of research coming out now. It's mostly, it's not the gluten, but the glyphosate or the sprays on top that trigger uh, a lot of the reactions. And so, but do you think that's going to be a pool from like, a consumer or a customer that that is looking for that hopefully reads the book ultra process people and, and other things or it's going to be more from like institution that and insurance that are starting to wake up for the immense cost we're all paying for uh, only the health side of things not even the environmental but only the health side of things is is tr like crippling our economies where almost wherever you are i think there's a it's a very good question and has two answers the first one is um, switching over um, cattle to grass-fed and um, uh, not spraying um, wheat and uh, using more ancient and, and healthier seed varieties and, and population varieties, using more A2-heavy dairy milk, uh, the casein protein that's easier for digestion, using grass-fed dairy. Those things happen in the background. You don't need any behavior change. If we could flip a magic switch and all of the meat would be grass fed. But you need a lot of behavior change of farm or ranchers and farm, like to no, get No, no, but out. I mean from the consumer. They yeah. can still eat all the same stuff and they will not, they, it will just taste better for them. So you don't need to do the very complicated thing of changing people's eating behaviors. And I think that's where I would start. The second one is much, much, much harder, which is how do you cure them from this ultra processed food addiction that was man-made? I mean, this was created by the industry. That is, I think, an extremely intricate problem. And I don't have such an easy answer to that one. You don't think taste is going to be enough to get us off the, the weird substances where were like food-like substances, I think. Michael Pollan calls it, um, that we're addicted to. Because I think, yeah, how do you reprogram your tongue, basically, and, and to to go for flavor, but not ultra-processed goo flavor? That is very tasty, because we've been trained to like that. I mean, I can tell you that I hate it. It's disgusting. Um, but I also acknowledge that, you know, like, if you're a smoker, after a year you're probably good. But that year is not really easy. I think that's a similar problem with ultra-processed food. Like you can retrain your taste. And I think after a year of not eating it, you'll probably think it's quite disgusting. But that year is just very hard. The transition, yeah. So that's not 
it's important, but not one of the focus areas. So it's much more on the production side to switch. And, and where do you see then the biggest sort of resistance against getting animals out basically and having their, their proper, um, role in, in landscapes? Like what, what's holding us back to, to, to do that? Is it science? Is it common knowledge? Is it, or like general knowledge? Is it, um, myths on, oh, we're going to produce a lot less or it's a lot more costly or like, what, what do you, what do you see as the biggest barriers there to, to get animals out of CAFOs basically? I think that, um, there is, it's, it's probably a little bit of, of, of the, all of the ones you said, which is like, uh, it's not the, the easiest, simplest answer. Like first CAFOs co-evolved with very large industrial slaughterhouses. And that lobby is surprisingly strong. And I'm, I don't think we should be mad at them. You know, they, they invested a lot of money. They run profitable big businesses. Um, and I think that this requires uh, a, a specific invention, in, in intervention by governments or others and just help them to transition. This is an industry transition problem for CAFOs. For smaller farms, I think there is a, like, that's a marketing and sales job, just educating them about it and, um, and, and also building some regional processing in, uh, um, capacity. Like you, you need to rebuild local slaughtering facilities that actually specialize on no long uh, animal transports, um, a, 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 an animal appropriate um, um, processing technology, and um, also prices that reward that behavior of farmers. And do you think there's a role for the vegan movement that, of course, like shares a lot of the values, let's say, on the the transition of slaughterhouses and CAFO operations as soon as possible, preferably yesterday, but then has a different sort of set of goals or a different underlying um, notion of the role of animals. Like, do you see a role of, because they're very loud, they're, they're good at marketing and, and good at, at storytelling to a certain extent. And um, what, what do you see? What do you see there? I think that first, every person has to make a choice if they want to uh, eat other animals or not. And I think that's a deeply personal choice and we should absolutely respect that. I think that if we eat animals, um, we owe to eat them with gratitude and a lot of respect. And we, I think, need to make a moral stance that if at all we eat animals, and I've been toying with that question, you know, um, then we need to make sure that these animals were able to live a life in harmony with their evolutionary purpose. Um, right now, that's clearly not the case. Fortunately, that could be the case quite easily. Um, think about it like you, you, you could argue like I, I once had a small business to focus on old milk cow steaks. So I wanted to, in Spain, these actually gain a premium of the market price because the, the meat is delicious. So you could say we let cows do their work. We let them out on the fields for 10, 12 years. We take some of their milk but, you know, not excessively. And at the end of their lifetime, after they helped us cycle a lot of carbon into the soils, you have a choice of either bury them or eat them. I think that this is a, this is an, an arguable choice that you could eat them, you know? Um, and so that's first on the, on the moral aspect of it. On your question about the marketing part, the challenge is that I think I've seen some proponents of veganism that um, start to refute science that we have about the impact of ruminants and the positive impact of ruminants on soil just because they want to get rid of us eating animals. I don't think that this is helpful. You know, I think that science is science and we need to just see it as it is and then take our own conclusions from it. We, but that leads us also to like the debate, it wasn't a debate, but a debate, like say Savory, Alan Savory and George Monbiot and some other very loud, again, Jonathan Foley, let's say the science isn't there. 
the science of positive impact of animals isn't there. They should basically, a ruminant specifically, and cows, they should disappear. And, and there's no way they can be uh, positive cyclists of, of nutrients and carbon, etc. And you're saying you're just not looking at the science. I, I have not seen any argument there that was based on science. And I've seen a lot of tapering with science that we have in order to fit their own mission. And I actually don't think it will, it really fits anyone's mission to tamper with evidence. And another thing you wrote in your primer, uh, which you're going to publish, um, just to push a bit of pressure, is that we're early on the talent inflow and, and it sort of reminds you of, or you, we can draw uh, connections to the early, the early internet boom or the technology boom that we've been going through for the last 20, 30, 40 years. Like explain a bit where, where we're at or where you see we're at in, in agriculture and why it's so, um, why it's such an exciting time for people like you to, to get into this. So when you look into an ecosystem, it, an ecosystem always starts with product innovation. Like we found out that we can build a graphical interface for computers. Before that, and without a graphical interface, basically what a graphical interface means is like you have keys with letters and those keys and letters display on the, display on the screen. Before that, you had basically very, very nerdy switchboards where you shifted, you know, bits around that would in the end very accessible. give you a, a binary outcome that would do a multiplication for you. I'm simplifying the whole thing a little bit. So there was a product innovation of a graphical interface. That graphical interface was built by electrical engineers. Um, it was built by scientists, by people to basically lived and breathe the product. This is a little bit where we are, I think, added in regenerative agriculture. Like the pioneers are actual farmers. Like some of them figured this out, not because they had a master plan, but because they went broke. They couldn't pay for the inputs anymore. So they went cold turkey and then they figured out that it actually brought positive change on their land and that yields recovered quite fast. So that's a little bit that story. But then the, the person that made the, um, the computer big was Steve Jobs, who was not per se an engineer. It was Wozniak who built it and Steve Jobs making it big. We have now a few Wozniaks in the regenerative agriculture space, but there are no Steve Jobs as yet. And so why is the moment now, like when you talk about sheer desperation, I think is, is an argument there. Um, but you see opportunities everywhere in, in the regen space. Do you see, start to see others seeing that too? Like, do you see others showing up like that famous video where there's one guy starting to dance on a hill, uh, very, very interestingly, very funnily. And, and, but the moment it starts to take off is when the second one shows up and joins this one, one, like at the moment it feels a bit like, uh, in your circles, maybe, maybe the only one, do you see others starting to show serious interest in food and ag, like you've been doing not to go through two years and 50 books and, and, and the, the, the super deep dive, but let's say enough to like, Ooh, actually my next career path, my next company, my next investments, my next, et cetera, et cetera, should be in this space because it's the most exciting one. Or are we not there yet that you get other people to join you? I do think that it started like, um, Lucas Walton of the Walton family. Um, incubated uh, a large fund. Um, a, a close friend of mine, Victor Friedbeck, is starting another big fund for sustainability and, and, and with a focus also on food and agriculture. There is um, former, you know, what you would call typical top talent from the industry, like consulting or um, finance, going into farming, like Benedict Bösel in, in Germany. Um, like it, it is popping up. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly not the only one seeing it, and I'm clearly not the first one seeing it. Um, I, I hope that we are reaching a tipping point where this is really accelerating. I just want to make sure that I'm not just hoping, but I'm, I can play an active role in it. And what do you see as your active role there? Except coming on this podcast, but here we're talking to the in crowd, so that's not that's not the most relevant. It's super relevant, all your your listeners, but not. We're not going to reach uh, 50,000, um, let's say, technology entrepreneurs that are looking for the next thing. 
So what do you see as your most relevant role now? Of course, it could be shifting, but like beginning of 2024, what do you see as your, your biggest lever that you have in, uh, in, in your time resources, as you mentioned? I think the first one is to understand it all well. I think like managing from above is not a good idea. Like, so first understanding where we are at and looking at it with a, like, let's say neutral eye. I'm not just are you buy a farm? everything. Like we, we are, we are lacking a lot of knowledge in some areas. We have a lot on others. I don't think me buying a farm is me having my highest impact. I think right now it is codifying a little bit what I've seen. I think not everybody has the, the time to spend two years on like going that deep. But that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of people who can still be incredibly helpful. So maybe just building a little bit, helping with my eye and, and my background to shed light on what is going on here to attract other people to join in. And then I think we can take it from there. And, and do you see like the primary you, you wrote and, and like what's the current state of agriculture, how we got into this and, and what are our opportunities and different narratives and pathways? Is that getting interest from the non-agriculture people? Like you see people reading that and, and is it opening their eyes, let's say, or having their moment yes. of a soil bitten bug thingy? Yes. Yes, it is. Which is fascinating because it's, it's text only. I mean, I've seen a lot of people, of course, going through that journey, um, either through plant medicine or documentary or very visual things, let's say. Um, but it's interesting that we're at a point where a primer of a number of pages gets people to, I mean, that are already interested, of course, it's not that you come out of nothing, uh, out of nowhere. And then what would you tell like your investor friends or people that manage either their resource or other people's resources, of course, without giving investment advice, but let's say if people have identified that their role is finance and their role is, is allocating resources, um, what would, what would be the main seed you would like to plant in their mind? Like if we do this live in a big theater and they walk out, of course, they're super excited after, but what's, if they record, re remember one thing and one thing only, what would you like them to remember from the evening we had? You can save the world and make money. And how do you make sure that doesn't sound naive or too good to be true? Like you can have lunch and you can, you can, you can have your lunch and share it. Like what's the, I mean, because I, that's the narrative it, that's super deep in us. That's like, no, 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 but that's not possible. Like how do we counter that naivety of, oh, okay, yeah, that's the, the dreamers on stage. I mean, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, you have an industry that it's by some means, the largest industry in the world where the primary means of production means in order to make a hundred, you need to spend 30 on inputs. And I can tell you that you don't need to spend that 30. That, that's a lot of margin. And the second thing is that when you now look away from a supply angle and to a demand angle, like you just look around yourself. I would tell them how many of you folks do like to eat shitty food and how many of you and your families care about what you eat. I think that a lot of hands will go up. So I said, like, why don't you just start bringing both together? You know there is demand and you know we can produce supply that caters to that demand a lot more uh, margin uh, friendly than what we do today. And yet I think we were like, yeah, but it was also the case. Like, wh why haven't we seen the Jobs, the Steve Jobs, the, the Elon Musks, not, not in that super concentrated way, but like big companies or bigger companies serving this. It's been mostly um, successful ones are relatively, they're bigger farms, but relatively small operations, not enormous amount of, of uh, revenue and not enormous margins, still struggling. We that will hire us on the podcast and they're, they're, they're surviving, they're fine. Um, but because they haven't built that huge direct-to-consumer machine it, every year is, is, um, is a challenge to get to the end of the year with enough revenue. Like why haven't we seen big breakthrough companies yet serving and, and, uh, let's say being, being successful, are we simply too early for that? I think that we are at a stage where this can happen. I think it's our job to make it happen. And what would you do if you had a billion dollars or a billion euros or whatever currency you want to invest in. But if you had a significant resources, not as much as uh, Lucas Walton, um, but you had a significant pot of money to, to put to work. I'm not looking for exact dollar amounts. I'm looking for what would be the main 
X priorities you would you would like to tackle with that. Could be very long term investment. It has to come back at some point. Um, but what would you what would you focus on? I would spend five percent. Let's say let's use a billion. You know, I would spend five percent of that on research and on lobbying. Just making sure that we understand the actual cost of agriculture in a factual way. These arguments of, yeah, but like this hippie agriculture cannot feed the world, it's too expensive. It drives me crazy because it's just plainly wrong. If we would just do simple, proper accounting of what our societies in tax dollars directly and indirectly spend on current agriculture, they would like Sudex is insane. This is so expensive, we cannot afford that. Uh, so that's the first part of that. You, you might need less than that amount. The second part is, uh, as I love building companies, I would just build a company. Um, I would build a fairly prop, uh, vertically integrated company uh, of a network of farms that would follow a certain playbook um, with proper accounting so that we can also open source the, the, the profitability change of those things. And then you build the regional processing and you build a few consumer brands out of it. Like think of building a modern Nestle, you know, like those companies, they had an origin uh, in a very benevolent way. They tried to liberate women from cooking all day and they succeeded. Um, then times changed and they went a little astray, you could argue. But we do have this impetus today. We need to basically save our population from decay uh, by eating, like they're eating food that makes them infertile, obese, and unproductive, and unhappy and depressed. So it's a large impetus. There is a role to build a new company around that. And that would cause, yeah, we would, could absorb uh, the, the, the other 95, 95%. And in terms of lobbying, what would you do? What would you target the most? Or what would be, I mean, there's so many policies to change. Um, but what, what would be your main, your main focus as lobby? I, I want to use like language that might look a little weird to you. I would enforce capitalism. I've heard too many arguments from the regenerative crowd that the problem is capitalism. I would argue the exact opposite. The problem is no capitalism. What happens in farming is basically communism. It's terrible. Most of farmers are paid by the government in the US as much as in Europe. That's a fact. You can look it up. Um, crop insurance basically means no matter what you do, you're going to get paid. Price guarantees. Like This is all absolute socialism. And then at the same time, property rights are not enforced. Like A lot of those uh, concentrated animal feeding operations are insanely polluting groundwater. Groundwater is a common good. It belongs to us but nobody enforces that. Like if I were to dump my toxic waste on your house, you would sue me, but nobody sues them for dumping it in our groundwater. So you cannot tell me that this is capitalism. Capitalism is property rights. Capitalism is pricing in externalities, no market failure. Capitalism is not paying you for no matter what you do and accepting that you're polluting our world. So enforcing would be your, your focus of lobbying and, and taking away a lot of the subsidies. I mean, let's just like, you know, if I pollute your house, I cannot do that. So we should stop doing that. Like just because groundwater is owned by the state doesn't mean you can just pollute it. Um, and these subsidies and the, the government schemes that basically um, are underwriting no matter what you do this has nothing to do with capitalism and you know i like to ask the magic wand question if there was one thing you could change overnight what would that be create a level playing field make current agriculture take get rid of their subsidies and charge them for the pollution they cause and then which the would transition close would most farms faster. and and which would close but how it would, how does it that would stop them following practices that are unprofitable and highly polluting 
but before you said we have to help, we shouldn't be mad at them and help them in the transition. Is this helping them in the transition or speeding up the transition um, with a stick relatively fast? I'm not saying we shouldn't, but how how would that, um, or are we too far down the line and we just have to to bite the bullet? No, 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 no. Um, you, you asked me for the magic wand. That's yes. what I would do. Uh, like then very fast, you know, we would need to build them plans to transition. And there's plenty of money going around to help them. If we stop paying them massive subsidies for the wrong practices, we can use that money to help them during the transition. You also said, because in we're early in, in terms of, or very early actually, in financial inflows, like there's a lot of money going around. There seems to be very little money going into, into regen. Why do you think that is? Is it missing the like institutional capital? They start to use the word in a lot of their slides. Um, I have yet to see billions flowing into the into the space, and the same in in VC, same in private equity, uh, land funds maybe a bit more. But if we all add them up, the series once in region, I think maybe we get to 10, million, 10 billion or something, um, maybe less. Like, what do you see on that financial inflow? What's what's holding that back? Is it the successful examples is it what do you see mainly like the interest seem to be there because the financial people are starting to wake up to the issue of the current system and the potential and yet somehow it sort of blocks and stays in london or in amsterdam or in new york or in delhi friends of mine they're called um, uh, the stuchteis um, they uh, run a company called the land banking group that is focused on solving that problem like how do you make nature investable investable great how do you, how do you, what do you need um, in a non-naive way to tap into institutional money? Because what you see right now, and, and, and they frame that very well, is like there is corporate like reinsurance companies saying like, look, we are picking up the bill anyway. Why don't we spend some of that money in advance to avoid that the bill is that big, you know? So there is interest out there, but there's nobody had built the bridge to allow them to invest in a way they can put on their corporate books. And so that is that is work that needs to be done. And I think once we do it, we can actually increase the inflow of capital into the ecosystem quite dramatically. Because the deal flow is there or has to be developed sort of alongside in parallel? I think in parallel. I think you, you need to create the, the meta vehicles like the ones that can absorb billions, and then they will not be the ones who can disperse that direct to farmers. That would not be a good model, but that's not a model that any other ecosystem has. You know, So um, a lot of the, um, the, the, the VCs and the tech space get their money from institutional aggregators or institutional or even partly government organizations that say, we want to foster European entrepreneurship so there's a fund for that. It's a meta fund that then disperses money through venture capital companies. And they are the ones actually putting it into actual corporations, startups. And we've had, we've yet to see that in, we've seen a few funds, very few. And like, yeah, it feels extremely early in, in that space to, like, that's why we're, we're hosting the podcast partly, but like the flow of capital is still um yeah really like drip irrigation and not a flood you you have you have small venture capital companies and few of them and their problem is usually they need somebody to anchor their fund it's basically they need one person who says i'll put in 20 30 percent of the total number that you've raised and i'm the one who underwrites the key terms um these this is often something that family offices are a little reluctant to do. Family offices would love to follow on, but they don't have they the They want to be the other 70, yeah. Yeah, they want to be part of the other 70. Um, and even in traditional, like it's a European technology, venture capital funds, often anchors are those meta investors, like the European Investment Fund or others, you know, they, because they are specialized on that and they know that by us, putting in some money with uh, more appetite for risk because basically they have a mission that says we want to foster the ecosystem. They can anchor a fund 
And then with that anchoring, the fund can go out and, and raise the bulk of its money on their own. So I think we, we just lack some of the key players of that ecosystem. And do you see a growing interest in food and ag and a level of knowledge that, that like to, to really to fully understand and not follow the next um, vertical farming uh, hype or the next? Because that's what I see a lot. A lot of people, like even in climate funds, they say, oh, we also need to do food and ag. And they have like a pillar and they end up doing nothing or very little or things that just basic engineering would probably say it doesn't work in terms of turning sunlight into something like like that that level of knowledge i feel is is missing a lot in the ivory towers of the financial sector and thus nothing gets allocated to the stuff we've been discussing for the last hour i think that's why we're talking and that's why i wrote the document that you referred to yeah. how to get that into the european investment bank and the the, the, the bigger allocators is uh, is crucial and then as a final i mean you've meant you mentioned a number of them, but I would love to know which, which one stands out the most. I mean, we both know John, John Kempf, and he like, loves to ask a question, what do you believe to be true about uh, agriculture in general? Um, actually, in this case, that's a good one. What do you believe to be true about agriculture um, that others don't? Like, where are you um, fundamentally contrarian, let's say, in, in the agriculture space? Uh, if you had to pick one, because we've heard a few. We can live alongside nature and promote animal welfare and our own health and make more money, not less. I think it's a perfect end to, to this conversation. I want to thank you so much, Martin, for the work you do, first of all, for going deep into the, the regen rabbit hole, actually different holes because there's so many different ones and now and, and reporting as you're falling down. Um, I don't think this is the last time we, we have you here because there's a lot developing um, a lot of things moving and, and I think there will be uh, so many other rabbit holes to go into and to explore together. So thank you so much for coming here, for sharing and for the work you do. Thank you, Kuhn, and thank you for all your work. Like, I mean, you uh, and John Kemp's podcast were two of the big sources of uh, both inspiration and knowledge. Thank you for that. That's why we, that's why we record. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.